Hi everyone, welcome back to the 5th Person Video Training Series. My name is Rusmin and I'm a co-founder of the 5th Person, Singapore Top Investing Portal. Okay, in the last video, I covered why you should invest in REITs if you want to build a steady stream of passive income. You can check out the video here. And in this video, I'm going to cover 5 important metrics when it comes to analyzing a REIT. And after this video, uh, you can use the checklist to help you to differentiate between a good REIT and a bad REIT, which is important because that's how you make money in the stock market. Okay, so in buying and investing in a good REIT will help you to get more and more dividends year after year. And at the same time, you may get a decent capital gain as well. Okay, so if you're ready, let's go. The first uh, metric is property. Okay, so I'm going to bring back the example of uh, investing in physical property, which I believe a lot of us have ex some form of experience in uh, investing in physical properties. If you are not, don't have to worry because I'm going to teach everything here from scratch. Okay, so let's assume you own uh, physical property and when you own this physical property and you list out, you collect rental income. Okay, so this rental income at the end of the day will have to minus off any expenses that incur in that particular year when you list out to someone else. Okay, so at the end of the year, you would have your net rental income. Okay, so if you were to buy that property that cost you about 1 million and if you collected net rental income of 50,000 in that particular year, your net rental yield is about 5%. Okay, so this is what most people know uh, and we usually call it as net rental yield if you buy uh, investment property under, or under our own name or our spouse name. Okay, so uh, this is what most people interpret it. They will ask, you know, what is the net rental yield for that property, this property and so on and so forth. Okay, so for REITs, uh, real estate investment trust this is exactly the same and but instead of calling net rental yield we call it as property yield okay and how we classify this term in their balance sheet or income statement is like this okay so they call it as gross revenue uh, instead of uh, rental income so gross revenue the rental incomes across all the properties in their portfolio minus of all the property expenses they incur in the particular year and they will have a net property income okay so your net rental uh, under your personal properties is the same as a REIT's net property income okay and you take net property income divided by property valuations you will get your property you okay so the same definition except that this is, this is a different terminology that's used by the accountant okay so if you were to look at uh, one example on how we can calculate the property you of a REITs in Singapore let's take a look at uh, phrases in the point trust okay so it's a REITs here listed in Singapore it's a mall REITs okay so they actually focus on malls and uh, if you go to their income statement or statements of total returns, uh, you can see that they actually have this gross revenue, basically the rental income that is collected across all the portfolio that they have. Uh, and that is actually equivalent to 182 million. Okay, so approximately. And they actually incur property expenses of 52 million running these uh, properties over throughout the year. And at the end of the year, they actually collected a total net property income of 129 million. Okay, so if you were to calculate the net property yield or property yield of this, uh, for instance, the point you can take 129 million divided by 2.6 billion. Okay, that's going to give you a property yield of 4.9%. And in 2016, if you go back to 2016, 2015, and you calculate the track, this is the same method and same process. The yield is about 5.2% in 2016. Okay, so when you calculate property yield, basically it's telling you that what is the property yield of that particular REITs uh, for all the assets they hold under that portfolio. Okay, so the higher, of course, the better. Again, it depends on what type of REITs, industrial REITs, uh, if you invest in industrial property, your yield is generally higher because the leases are much shorter. But if you invest in uh, office uh, properties in Singapore, your yield may be actually slightly uh, lesser. You're talking about 4.5% to uh, 4%. Okay, so for most REITs in Singapore, generally the property yield is about 5% to 5.5%. As long as the, this figure is stable within this range, uh, generally your job is to make sure that it is stable and it's consistent and if the yield is dropping let's say to 4%, 3.5%, 3% meaning to say that uh, the property valuation either have gone up or the net property has income actually come down. Okay, This is something of course you have to ask the management why is that happening. Okay, so But most of the time and in most cases the property yield across uh, certain REITs usually they have a very consistent uh, figure okay and this is your job as an investor to make sure that this figure is consistent if not you have to check with the managers 
Or if you manage to find a VIX that have a very similar profile, that has a higher property yield than the one that you're actually analyzing, then they actually give you a lot of question mark on the property valuation because the lower the property yield, the more aggressive the manager is. Okay. So if uh, a good comparison, of course, for present the point would be uh, comparing against uh, Capital Land More Trust. Okay. Because these two REITs are more REITs and they are have the same profile and most of their properties are in Singapore. Okay, so their property use should more or less be almost the same, which is currently the case. Uh, for Capital More Trust, the property use is also about 5.2, 5.3%, while, while for uh, Francis Center Point is about 5%. Okay, so this is not something that uh, is worrying, but if one day, let's say Francis Center Point, the property will drop to, let's say, 3.5% versus Capital Land More Trust, where they are still valuing their property at 5.5%, then that actually gives you a lot of question marks. Okay, you need to ask the managers uh, why are they so aggressive with their property valuation. But at this moment, of course, there is, there, I don't have any good example to show you, but basically, monitor the property you make sure that it's consistent and make sure that it is almost on par within the same industry standard okay so there are another term that some people may call property you uh, as a capitalization rate okay so but basically they mean the same the second metrics that you need to know is uh, cost of debt this is basically the borrowing cost and if you buy the same property for one million you come up cash of four hundred thousand dollars and you take a loan from the bank six hundred thousand dollars you need to pay interest on that loan okay so uh, interest rate for this example is three percent but in the REITs example we usually call it as cost of debt okay so basically we also want to find out what is the cost of debt for that particular REITs and you know, how much they are paying the interest to the bank for the money that they borrowed from the bank okay so uh, this is the use uh, cost of debt across different uh, REITs. Okay, so I'm just going to give you three examples here. Uh, Capital Land More Trust, the cost of debt is about 3.2%, and uh, Savannah REITs is about 4.2%, and Parkway Life REITs is about 1.4%. As you can see, that Parkway Life REITs is basically a healthcare REITs, which they run their own hospital assets. And uh, generally, bankers also know that, that this hospital is usually more stable. They are willing to give up this loan at a lower uh, interest rate. Okay, whereas for Savannah, which is the industrial REITs, and the industrial uh, rental prices can go up and down, and uh, and this will come viewed as a relatively riskier as compared to uh, malls and also the uh, healthcare assets. Okay, that's why the cost of debt is generally higher. Okay, so the cost of debt across different types of REITs will have a different range. Okay, so there's no uh, rule of thumb what is the cost of debt because it depends on the interest rate environment if you are in the interest rate the environment where interest rates are very high the cost of debt generally can be very very high if uh, as of now 2018 the interest rate uh, for generally in uh, Singapore context is relatively low that's why the cost of debt is fluctuating at about 3% 4% or good REITs like uh, Parkway Life REITs is about 1.5% or 2% okay so uh, from interest rate rate itself the, the cost of debt is that we can tell the profile of certain reads okay the, so like those uh reads that have a lower cost of debt you know that their profile is actually less riskier okay whereas for savannah is definitely much higher so the cost of debt give you a good indication whether these reads are volatile or not okay so this is a very good uh, ratio that i usually look at and the third uh, important metric that you need to know is of course the gearing ratio okay and this is where you assess whether the REITs are taking excessive loans from the bank because a lot of REITs got into trouble when they take on too much debt okay so how you calculate the gearing ratio is basically if you buy the property one million and you come up cash four hundred thousand dollars and the rest of money you take from a bank that means to say that your bank or your gearing ratio is actually almost uh, 60 percent okay so for personal uh, if you buy uh, property under a personal level, usually bank will say loan to uh, valuation and they're going to give you a 60% loan to valuations uh, ratio. Right? But for uh, REITs, usually we call it a gearing ratio. Uh, gearing ratio implies the same thing, uh, total bank loans over asset valuation. So in this case, the gearing ratio is 60%. Okay? Again, it's just a different terminology. Okay? So don't get frightened by all this. Uh, ratio they are very very simple once you know it once you learn it basically you will stay with you forever okay so REITs in Singapore are tightly regulated and they are only allowed to borrow up to 45% of their total asset okay meaning to say that they are not like uh, 
uh, us who can invest in property, we can borrow up to 70%, 80% for our private uh, properties. But for REITs, they actually can only borrow up to 45% of their total asset. I mean to say that they are much more conservative as compared to uh, a lot of uh, people who buy a physical property in Singapore who they take on a lot of debt. Okay, so REITs, uh, government actually stated saying that uh, they need to have their borrowing not more than 45%. Okay, so this also gives a very good benefits why we should invest in REITs. Again, they are relatively safer as compared to uh, you taking out a lot of the loans from the bank, okay? So a uh, gearing ratio again can be easily calculated. Sometimes it's given to you by the company or the REITs itself. You can actually find it in the annual report. If not, you can easily calculate based on their total bank loans that the REITs have over the total assets that they have. Okay, so like in the case of Capital More Trust, um, the gearing ratio is about 35%, Savannah is about 43%, and Parkway Life REITs is about 36%. Okay, so as a rule of thumb, I do not like REITs to have a gearing ratio of more than 40%. I like to have some buffer of 5% so that it doesn't hit on the uh, regulations uh, limit. Okay, so you can see Sabana is more aggressive when it comes to taking on debt, whereas Capital Land, More Trust, and Parkway Life REITs are more conservative when it comes to taking on um, debt. The fourth metric that you need to know is price to book ratio. Okay, so basically, uh, go back to the same example uh, of owning a physical property of one million. If you come out four hundred thousand uh, dollars, you take up bank loan of six hundred thousand dollars. Basically, your uh, equity value is basically uh, four hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so in the REITs context, uh, they call it equity. So equity is four hundred thousand dollars, which is you come out everything cash by yourself, and then you have loan from the bank, which is captured usually under liabilities. They call it uh, bank loans about six hundred thousand dollars and then you have total assets of one million okay so uh they again mean the same it's just different terminology so don't get frightened by that uh and how to get book value is basically very simple equity book value is the same except the equity if you take the equity value divide the number of uh, share outstanding or in which we call it units uh, you get your book value. Okay, so how to calculate your price to book ratio? Basically, you take the price divided by book. Okay, so and share price over book value, and that's where you get your price to book uh, ratio. Okay, so how do you interpret price to book ratio? It's very very simple. If the company has a, a REITs has a price to book ratio of one, theoretically it says that the company is trading at a fair valuation. Okay, meaning to say that if that company the asset is worth one dollar basically the book value is worth one dollar the market is selling and buying at one dollar so we know that it's fair valuation because that is worth that asset is worth one dollar is is being traded at one dollar okay so fair valuation so this is based on theory uh if it's uh 0 0.5 uh times or price to book meaning to say that it's under valuation meaning to say that the assets the net asset value or book value is one dollar and the market is actually selling and buying at 50 cents okay so this is quite obvious case where price to book of 0 0.5 is undervalued meaning to say that we want to buy when the price to book is 0 0.5 of course this is based on theory okay i just want to explain to you the theory first and then i will warn you what is the setback of this ratio okay and if it's like 1.3 times meaning to say that this particular piece of asset is worth one dollar but the market is willing to buy or sell at a dollar and thirty cents okay meaning to say that the market is overpaying above the valuation okay of course this doesn't make sense so based on theory we have to buy here and sell here okay but in practical it doesn't always happen the case because in uh, REITs or real estate investment trust the way the asset is being valued can be very very subjective and it's a very gray area and the independent valuer will have a different price tag for the different type of properties okay so a lot of people may come with different conclusions at the end of the day uh, a REITs are trading at 0 0.5 to book or 1.3 it doesn't say a lot of things whether the the REITs is undervalued or overvalued okay so this is something which i want to warn you first because a lot of people make the same mistake over and over again when they start to invest in REITs okay then one of the first metrics that they look at is of course price to book ratio they want to buy REITs that is uh, trading at below one and then hopefully to sell it when it's above one okay it doesn't work that way uh, but i just want to warn you in this video okay so uh, don't use 
price to book alone to make investment decision. Okay, this is a very, very important uh, reminder that I want you to know in this video. And also the second, uh, another common mistake that people have is of course the fifth metric that you need to know is the dividend yield. Okay, so when you first started investing, a lot of times I hear people that, oh, this REITs is paying uh, 5% yield or no, this one is much better because it's giving us a yield of uh, 6% or even better, 9%, okay? And a lot of time people make decision based on the yield alone. Okay, so you have a yield risk they're giving you six percent yield, then you call it decent. If it's four percent, uh, low yield, not attractive. And if a risk they're giving you eight nine percent, wow, that is very attractive. We should invest in this kind of risk. Again, that can it can be very dangerous if you uh, were to make decision based on yield alone. Okay, because we all know that there are different type of risks in the market. Okay. And you have healthcare REITs, you have malls, you have office, you have industrial, you have hotel, which is under hospitality. And different type of REITs will have different uh, risk profile. And we come with different risk profile, you have a different uh, dividend yield. Okay, that's why uh, I want to warn you in this video that you do not buy a REIT solely based on the price to book ratio or dividend yield. Okay, so uh, this is a very important point to take note of. So by now you should learn a lot of insights about REITs and five important metrics to analyze them. Okay, and they are property yield, cost of debt, gain ratio, price to book, and dividend yield. Okay, I personally use this metric myself and when it comes to analyzing REITs in Singapore and Malaysia, and so far they have worked very well for me. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you're interested to learn more about uh, building passive income with REITs and dividend stock, we have a coaching program where we will show you how to find the best dividend stocks and REITs in Singapore and Malaysia. Okay, you can find out our coaching program at dividendmachines.com. Okay, and as a bonus for completing this video, we have actually compiled a list of Singapore REITs that have been increasing uh, their DPU distribution per unit year after year, and you can download this list completely free. Okay, you can find the download link in the description box below. And uh, if you like this video, please hit the like button and be sure to subscribe to our channel and remember to share it with your friends. Okay, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.